Another question? I guess no. It was either incomprehensible or very clear. They will be, yes, I'll stick it on my website in a minute. Uh, yeah, so there, there should be, there should have been a link in there somewhere. It, you mean the scripts for doing the bootstrap analysis stuff? Uh, I would hope there was one in there somewhere. Um, I think the first slide actually had... There. There's a git repo. And there's a readme in there. If you just type what the readme says, stuff works and you get, ah, this is cool, I see how this goes. So, is anyone who comes to write that down got it? Good. Good, is it? It's better. So uh, it seems pointless waiting for 15 minutes for the next thingy to start. So I guess we have part two, which probably needs a gobby session. How do I change the name of a gobby document? Uh, Wookie? In uh, IRC, people are asking if there is a uh, kind of guide for test your package cross-building. A guide. So there's, yeah, I, there's a link on the last page of the PDF um, which has um, the, basically the place... The, Yeah. If some, if some people are going to talk to someone, being here, mm -hmm. uh, they should be able to do it or get two people to be. You know what I mean? And I disagree with that. People are standing where I am. Uh, yes, if you want to find out about the cross building stuff, that URL is what I think of as the top of the document tree. Uh, so there's a link there to doing multi-arch cross-building, um, which will be probably the best place to start. Uh, and I'll add a link to this. So, right, okay, so I just give it a name. So this will be... Um, multi-arch cross-building.
It still says new document. Okay, I didn't see that. Let's try to get out ah, there. Right, okay. You are? Okay, yes. right. You want, you want some water? Uh, that will be useful, actually, yeah. Should I bring the one? Yeah, please. Right. So, there's a gobby document um, there. Oh, I see. He's put a new document in. Oh, well. We'll do it that way, then. So it's very difficult running a boff in a room like this. It doesn't really work. Um, <laughs> come closer, come closer. Um, right, OK, so uh, this document contains a list of seven issues, which I think were all mentioned in the previous talk. Um, if I went away with any sort of answers or opinions on them, that would be helpful. So running foreign arch binaries during install of library packages. Does everyone agree that just saying or true everywhere is OK? I didn't do that. Somebody else is highlighting. Oh, no, it's just somebody's color, isn't it? Um, yeah. It says running foreign arch binaries during install. So this is um, libglib that runs whatever the hell it is it runs. Did I put the examples in here? Yes. So um, glib compile schemas and gtk query im modules 2 and all this libgvc5. I don't know what any of these things do. Um, but when we're crossing, I'm pretty sure we don't care. And running those binaries won't help. If you have QEMU installed, it'll just do something, which is probably the right thing. It might use the wrong files. <laughs> um, I don't suppose the maintainers of these packages are here? No, of course not. So does anyone have anything to say? I think we should just say, make them effectively, if you just say or true, then it becomes a warning. You still get it printed out as a couldn't find file blah. The, the only problems we had when we were trying to do this with MDB and Crush was that sometimes some of these packages will put a dummy file or they'll put a, uh, a placeholder in, in the way, and then when you're trying to install the package, you just cross-build, it won't overwrite it. So you won't actually get the cache, and you have to rerun the thing on device. You have to invent a way of regenerating this data, which should have come from build time. It was moved out of the post inst into the build structure some years ago. And there was some confusion with a lot of the, I think it's mainly the, the known maintainers, there was some confusion about well, exactly why that was done with the uh, idea that it was because of some kind of cross-building issues. Okay. So that we need to re re go around that loop again and try and work out, go back to the history, why was that change made in the first place? Uh, was it for their reasons or for ours? Was it a mistake on our part? And can we undo it, please? OK, so you mean so we, we did have these things taken out and done at build time, and now they've been put back into the I've, runtime installer. I, I seem to remember that when we were doing this, there, there, there was a mix between packages that did this work in the post-inst and packages that were starting to do it in the build system. 
Okay. Um, and obviously, for cross-building purposes, the post is the right place to do it. Right. Whether there was some kind of um, sequencing problem there, and whether Deepakish triggers could have fixed that, but weren't available at the time, and therefore they did it another way during the build, we've got to go through that with the, the relevant maintainers. Okay. Those were the issues that we found at the time. Are there any known people here? No. So, um, I guess we'll send patches in that say all true for now uh, and see if anyone complains. Um, so, uh, yes. So, you, I mean, you could be a bit cleverer than all true, which is what this. Uh, so you could check whether you are cross-installing. And now I don't think the postint is going to have dev build arch available unless it runs dpackage architecture to get it. And I'm not sure the postints can rely on dpackage architecture being present. Can it, Steve? Sorry? Oh, because it'll still run the wrong version. Of course, in the postinst, you, you're not going to have any clue as to what architecture you were built on, which is what matters here. Uh, does an installing package not know what architecture it is? Oh, no, when you're installing it, you know which architecture you're installing on. Yeah. Yes. Does a package not know, a deep package knows what architecture it's installing for, and it knows whether it's foreign or not. Sorry, yeah. I'm looking at it the other way. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure, we, so we can always run deep package dash dash print architecture, and we'll get to know what native is. Um, so I don't know. We could try a fancy test, but I'm not sure if that would just go wrong as often as the existing thing. What do you think, Steve? Microphone. Come and sit closer. I know you'll have things to say. So one of the considerations there is when you're talking about the post doing things that you, you don't care about when you're cross-building, the distinction there is not whether it's a native architecture package or a foreign architecture package. The actual distinction is whether you're installing it because you want to use it as a, a, a runtime library or as a build dependency. And that's where it gets tricky because if I'm cross-installing i386 versions of these libraries, I expect the post to, to run to and succeed. Right thing. And if it fails, it makes a difference. Yes, so, good point. Uh, um, I'm not sure that the, I, I see a, a perfect solution to all of this anywhere because we, we certainly don't have any way to express the idea of I'm installing this because it's a cross-dependency. And I, mm. I guess we could encode some conventions and have those well, populate the environment if, or if whatever. If you do this test that. right, you can say if I'm cross-installing uh, and it failed, then that's not a failure. So, Except that's so that not... So that, if, yeah. you're, if you're installing i386 on AMD64, it's a cross install. Yes. If it fails, that's actually a bug, yes. not something that should be ignored. Indeed. Um, it would be a compromise because it, it would usually work. Um, right. And that would be, it. and you'd still see the warning. Right. But yeah, it wouldn't actually cause the package install to fail and do all the right. Right. So I guess. Uh, as far as compromises go, the current one you're going with is as good as anything else as far as I'm concerned. Um, if we're going to do something different, we should figure out exactly what the semantics are mm. to do it right. And so we actually have some capability of saying, ignore this failure when cross-installing. And otherwise, no. Now, actually, you could encode this logic in your cross-build environment and have a dpackage divert lying in wait on the file system if you know you're going to be doing this. And you could just have this, this pre-divert the script, have it replaced by a symlink to bin true, and then the post in succeeds. But that's, a, you know, we, we want to kind of get away from encoding all that logic in our, our yeah. cross-build environments. Mm -hmm. Actually, Steve, there's a question for you as much as anything else. When we're doing this in the post in is there a way of working out that the, the compiled binary, the ELF binary we're trying to run, is something we can safely run because of the, of the setup we currently got. So that if you're on i386 and the, uh, the, the script wants to call a binary that we know is AMD64, we know that's probably under certain ways or, or, or the other end on that, that would be okay. But we, if we could determine from even something like libmagic that the file yeah. is... 
So Not you kind of we could do. You, you, you want a sort of is runnable tool, which would say, yeah, I'm, this is i386 and AMD64. That's runnable. We expect that to work. And, and N no. However, I just had a great idea for an evil hack, which is QEMU works by installing a bin format handler logic for um, telling in in proc. You tell the kernel how to run this elf binary. You could tell the kernel that the way you run all elf binaries of this architecture is by passing them to bin true. Yeah. <laughs> can, we, can we temporarily install a bin format handler and then take it away again, <laughs> I guess? Right? That's quite scary, isn't it? That's a little bit scratch box. <laughs> but it's not completely crazy. That's an interesting idea. Um, somebody write that down. OK, uh, I guess that's enough of that for now. Um, Jar path, should we ever need it? Is it important? Um, are there things, oh, it seems to me that any, anything where in the build we have to take the R path out again is just because we built it wrong in the first place, isn't it? But sometimes that's a fairly fundamental bug in the upstream system. And it will be hard to fix. Yeah, repeating for the benefit of the video, um, sometimes that is a pretty fundamental bug in the upstream build system, and maintainers are using chirpath-d because they can't figure out a saner way to do it in polynomial time. OK. So it seems to me that bin utils ought to be able to help with this, because it knows about all the obj format foo. I don't know how hard it is to make a chirpath that would deal with foreign binaries properly using bin utils multi-arch style stuff. Or whether, in fact, just not bothering again is ever really a problem when cross-building. I guess you end up with binaries that might have our paths in you didn't want. Uh, and that's probably bad. So if anyone wants to have a look at how difficult that is, because, I mean, it's, it's just a little thing in the header, isn't it? There's a few bytes in the header. It's just that you need to know whether it's big endian or little endian and how many bytes things are encoded in in order to fiddle with it. So maybe we could just make Chirapath a bit smarter. Uh, and it would just need to, to use libbfd or something to be able to do the right thing. Where did, is it our tool, in fact? So minor thing, Wookie. Can you increase the font size and basically make more of the pad visible? Uh, no. <laughs> Left. That one. Oh, that one, right. Ah. Edit. Preferences. Ah. Do you reckon? Is that enough? Is that adequate? Thank you. Good point. We get rid of that as well. Whoa, whoa, God, it's, it's enormous. <laughs> no, that's much better. You're right. It's all right. I, I can see it from here. Okay, so I think that's enough of Chirapath. Um, multi arching Perl. So I had a. So one of the reasons uh, things I forgot to mention is one of the reasons loads and loads of build dependencies don't install is because something depends on Perl or Python. And currently, neither of those are properly multi-arched, so it, you don't get your dependencies. And there's an awful lot of things that use something Perly or something Pythony. Um, Perl actually seems to be quite simple. Um, there is one Perl library. Uh, some packages do link against it. So if you have a, a C API to Perl, it links directly against that library. So we need to be able to have that multi-arched, but I think we just have to make, so at the moment, there's a libperl package, right, which doesn't contain the library, it just contains some docs, and there's a Perl package, Perl base, which contains the library and everything else, and you go, okay, I don't know why that is, um, does anyone here know why that is? I mean, it's possibly because if you had a separate library 
and pearl base, you'd have to be really careful when upgrading them to make sure you did them both together because you're using pearl during the upgrade and everything would blow up. Uh, I'm assuming we have mechanisms for that stuff. But in fact, I think all we have to do is make the library in a multi-arch path inside pearl base, exactly as it is now, declare it aloud, and we're done. Does anyone disagree? Does that make sense to you, Steve? Yeah, I, I, sorry, I missed the first bit of what you were saying. So okay, I'm trying so to remember exactly what the details are of, of how Perl is put together. Because um, I think at one point the libperl library package was a virtual package on some architectures and a real package on, well, not a virtual package, but a dummy package on some architectures uh, and a real package on others. Okay. And I'm, I was just looking now and I see that on AMD64 it's a dummy package and I don't know why that is. Because there's a Perl API package as well, which I guess is the one you depend on to get the right version. Right, so Steve McIntyre is saying that it's a, it's a real package on i386 and a dummy package on AMD64, which I seem to remember, I, I remember that being the opposite, because what I remember is... Someone repeat what Noodle said. Please, can you repeat for the stream? Uh, if, if you actually look at the description of, of libperl on an AMD64 box, it says that it's... Um, Shared Perl library for architectures where the Perl binary is li statically linked to libperl, which is only i386. So it's a dummy package everywhere except i386. Okay. Yeah, the point for the i386 being static, I think, was to do with uh, fpig. Does that make our lives harder in terms of just saying Perl is multi-arch allowed? And we could and we could make libperl multi arch same, I guess. Uh, does that mean we have a problem if you have libperl base that has got the foreign library and then libperl i three eight six when it's in a different package? I guess we'll have to sit down and have a think. Unfortunately, I don't think there's any Perl core people here. There's only Perl module people. Um, but it looks tractable to me, and I think we should just try it. Um, Python is harder. Docco has been looking at that. Docco? <laughs> huh? huh? I was just saying Python multi arching. You've been having a look. What, how, where are we at? What do we need to do? What's left? How hard is it? <laughs> okay, but do, do you know what needs doing? or you're not sure yet? Well, the thing is that uh, upstream is not cost buildable at all. So you have to um, get cost built support upstream first, and then you can okay. think about... Well, making it multi-arch ready so that we can install the parts separately is, is technically a separate problem from can we cross build the package itself, right? And yeah. we'd like to do both of these things, but for everything else to be installable, we right. just need the multi-arch stuff in the packaging. Yeah, but it needs to be done. It's being done, but it's not yet ready. Okay. Because I thought Python already cross-built. Okay. Um, so do I just leave that to you and it will happen one day? Do you have any idea when one day is? <laughs> After DebConf, he said. So Python and Perl are both quite big blockers in terms of being able to install cross dependencies, so I'm quite keen to <laughs> fix those kind of next, really. Yeah, of course, going back to Perl, the issue is if you want to cross build lots of your Perl modules, then you don't just need a multi-arched Perl, you need Perl with the architecture definitions in the, essentially, the site config already set up for each of the, for, for the architectures you're cross building for. Okay, so the a kind of Perl config type Yeah, thing, essentially. Which uh, the build presumably generates and we don't currently put in a dev package? Ish. I mean, it basically defines it as you build it natively. So 
what we had for an initial Perl cross build was we just ended up with a config for each architecture yes. would end up being installed. Uh, so and there's, then you there's do it a that separate way. Perl cross building question. So there's there's basically creating a config for each architecture kind of manually, and then saying right that's how you cross build Perl. So don't run all the gubbins it normally runs. Uh, which it tries to do on a native machine with an SSH connection. Uh, here's the answers, just use that. And that works, you just have to maintain it for each new architecture. But someone ha upstream has kind of auto conf all the innards of Perl to make it cross-build properly and sent it to the Perl list about a year, two years ago and was roundly ignored. Nobody said a sausage. They didn't say no, they didn't say yes, they didn't say anything. So there's a pending question of whether we should just say, do you guys want to do this so that it just works forevermore? Uh, I don't care. It's, um, a, it's been on my to-do list for, well, as you know, for months and months to go and talk to the Pearl folks about the cross-build stuff that we did have working. Um, but that was against Pearl 5.12, mm -hmm. and the world changes totally with every Pearl release. So uh, the, the patch Steve's done uh, is uh, 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 Patrick McDermott's been updating it for 5.14. So I think we have, without too much work, a build that will work for now. Um, it will be nice if Upstream wanted to fix this properly, um, but I think the, the being able to install everything else that depends on it part is a lot more important. Um, well, I guess we need both, ultimately. Um, that's what's really holding up everything else to find out whether they even build or not. Um, so you're saying we need the modules part. So this, does that mean we need a, we need a Perl dash dev that contains, um, you know, uh, arch config for each? Yes, essentially. If you want to okay. be able to build, to cross build any of your Perl modules, then you need that. Okay. So this comes back to a more general question of, we've got lots of things which have some kind of arch specific how I built myself config. Right, all those config scripts that aren't currently package config, uh, and Perl, and Apache has its own weird, crazy shit, which is even crazier. Um, and, and should we stick all of that in some kind of cross-support package? So you just install all of it for all the architectures that we support in a big bucket, so we know where to look? Uh, or do we have lots of tiny packages containing cross configs. I'm not quite sure what to do with that information. The mo so at the moment, we're collecting all the autocomp information inside dpackage cross. And maybe we should rename it to be called cross support or something. Um, yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. A cross support hyphen architecture or something. Um, and then the question is, how would that collect build config from a whole pile of other packages? I mean, we could just maintain it manually, but that doesn't seem very likely to stay working for very long, does it? I guess that's what we're doing for autoconf stuff. Yeah, exactly. Somebody has to do it, so pulling it together into one central place, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe that's not crazy talk. Uh, what else is on this list? Python, Docker is going to fix it all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so all these config files. So m most of these are nearly architecture independent. Um, until you multi-arch the package, at which point the lib path gains an architecture-dependent bit, uh, annoyingly. Uh, and the dash C flags option is often architecture-dependent, because it says with dash SSE or something, um, which I assume uh, depends on your arch. Um, so yeah, I guess we either stick something in our cross-support package, or um, try and make people use package config. Has anyone, I, I guess you haven't actually tried this with any upstream saying, can we just use package config, please? I have no idea whether it's likely to be, there's reasons they're avoiding it because they're kind of core packages and they don't want to depend on package config. No, we had some success with, um, I think it was Corber and Orbit when we were doing this and we went upstream and they just said, Oh, we forgot to take that out. We don't want to use it anymore. How do we use package config instead, please? Okay, so a lot of this is probably just old, and nobody's seen a need to change it. Okay. Um, so TCL is a bit different from the others because the script lives in user lib version TCL rather than user bin. 
So I don't know whether we can just multi-arch the script and have the, different, have the version for that architecture. So that's the other thing you could do with these, is you could install each one and use a lib arch foo instead, and then just keep them exactly as they are and make sure the build can find them. Right. I mean, a lot of the problems with trying to get rid of any of these per library uh, config scripts that, that are running around right now is, is not so much persuading upstream that they should use package config instead. It, a lot of it is to do with these are now interfaces that are exposed to the software that builds on them. Um, yes. And there's going to be a long transition period if, if we're saying we have to fix these upstream. Um, now, the idea of, of moving the tools into an architecture qualified path and just using a path setting in the build is is one possibility. Um, that that's a transition we could do relatively quickly just within Debian, um, because you yes, just right. have to poke the the related set of packages to to export the right path um, right. in the environment. So yes, you mean anything that builds against one of these libraries generally uses config dash dash c flags to make sure it's built with the same c flags. Um, yeah, I haven't got statistics on just how many uses there are of these things. Um, I haven't seen huge numbers, but um, as you say, it is an interface. Okay. Um. It is it is possible to make some of the old config strips just to be a uh, an empty wrapper around the the package config call, so that the the, the upstream package could provide the PC. Data. It did, it something did. over there has something to say? Mike over there. Yeah, you, you can work around some of those. We need more mics. It'll be a lot quicker. It will. You will get more problems than you solve. It's better to fix it properly with package config files to begin with without wrapper scripts, because it's going to introduce more bugs. The main problem with trying to turn the script into a wrapper script around package config, um, and the reason I haven't actually gone out and done this, for instance, for free type, which I maintain, is that you don't get the triplet logic. So if you actually have to get the PC file, which is architecture specific, and you're not using the package config wrapper that has the triplet qualifier, which autoconf needs to work out which version to call, and so we don't have any interfaces to do that. So that's why I've not done this. It, the, right, the right answer is going to require some autoconfery fixing in the build system of the reverse dependencies, so you might as well just have them all use package config directly anyway. Right, what else have we got here? Oh, yeah, so package config, so triplet foo. So I think this general concept is useful to call anything architecture specific as triplet thing, uh, which we can probably do in quite a lot of places. Uh, Autoconf already understands that, so it's convenient to use that mechanism. Um, we've done it for package config and it works, so there's, there's Package config cross wrapper is one file, and all it does is sets the path according to the triplet name you called it with, uh, and then does its normal thing, and that works fine. Um, so you need a package for each architecture which just contains the link, um, which is kind of sucky. <laughs> Um, you, you can and we could just put them all in, in cross support and have loads of links, but the yeah. problem is that then we, have the, then we have the link with no package config behind it, maybe. And I don't know whether, if autoconf checks that it's working, I guess that won't matter. Uh, that it's kind of nice if we could just ship the whole caboodle rather than have hundreds of tiny packages containing links for not just package config, but a whole lot of other things as well, potentially. Um, I mean, at the moment, the, the dpackage cross cross config uh, files, it just it does just lump everything onto your system. 
So you install Deepak Cross and suddenly your system knows how, uh, what the endianness is of Spark 32 and all this kind of crazy yes, stuff that goes exactly. on. It just lands in one and, big and place. And that's not a problem for autoconf because of the way those files get used. But it does mean that we've already got a mechanism to split those out into individual binary packages and then you've got packages that aren't just symlinks, they have got useful data in them. I see what you mean. I mean, if we split deep packages... If you split them there, then you've got uh, somewhere... You split it up into per architecture cross support packages. It's too small to put on its own. Yeah, maybe that would make more sense. Um, so at the moment, there is a package config cross package um, which generates... Um, 13 tiny packages. Um, that's what Ubuntu's done. Uh, that actually comes out of the toolchain base foo package. Um, and uh, I'm increasingly coming around to the idea that I think I want a multi art support package to dump a load of stuff in, sorry, a, a cross support package to dump things into. Um, yeah, and this object introspection thing, which is awkward. Um, there's a wiki page that I should have put the link in to, uh, which is here somewhere. Um, is that, that one? Here we are. Yes, magic. Um, so I still haven't found anyone to explain to me exactly how this works and what it's used for, um, but this is a reasonable description. So anything you, any binary you build that uses G object library can be scanned to find which G objects it used, and because G objects know about, I don't know, what it is they do, you can generate an API from that, is my understanding. And quite a lot of the GNOME stuff uses that. And it all makes sense because you build things and then you build the API from it and the docs from it and everything, and it all matches up so you can't screw it up. Um, it's just not cross friendly. Um, so someone should get really enthused and make it work. Um, I don't really have anything useful to say about it at the moment. At the moment, we've been able to just not run it. And at the core packages, that seems to work OK. But I bet you can't build GNOME without at least some object introspection working. Anyone have any? Opinions, suggestions, people we should hassle, I don't know. No, okay, we don't know. Um, it's not critical right now. We're trying to bootstrap core systems. You can kind of ignore this. Uh, if you want to cross-build stuff with desktop packages in, uh, you start to care about this. That was my list of issues. Um, There's the QEMU problem, I suppose. So quite a lot of this you can gloss over by just installing QEMU. I don't know whether it... So now your binaries will run, but they might still run on the wrong files. Um, but it lets you get further. It's not much use for new arch bootstraps where QEMU doesn't exist, which is currently what I actually care about. So I'm mostly avoiding it. But it, I guess one of the things I'd like to do on the rebuild D was have it running, building everything with QEMU and without, just to see how much difference it made. But unfortunately, that was awkward to configure because rebuild D is a bit thick. Uh, so I haven't yet. If anyone is enthused to try that, that would also be very interesting. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, um, the, the config scripts and the, the caching scripts, they look for things in non-triplet-based paths, and they will, just they will just use whatever they find in, so they, they, they could quite easily pick up the wrong architecture. Yes, it's quite likely to get the wrong and, architecture. And scan the wrong stuff. The wrong stuff. So yes. it, but that's a quite, uh, quite an easy check, because you can just do an MD, MD4 checksum compared to the original architecture of the content of the file. And you should find whether those actually are um, I386 copies on RML, et cetera. OK. Oh, so that's the other thing which is um, definitely of interest and needs doing is tools to check, so it could be Lintian checks or some other tool to actually look at the output package. So I mean, I've got a pile of cross-built binaries, which currently aren't exposed on the net, but they could be very easily, uh, and just 
comparing the differences between the cross-built package and the normal package. You know, how many files are missing? How many files are the wrong architecture? And then look at the binaries themselves and say, do I have the same uh, ELF header parts? Does it look like it might be the same thing? Um, I think if we had those QA tests, we'd be a lot more convinced that what we were building was actually useful. Um, I haven't done any work at all on that. Um, I'd love somebody to, if we could just knock up a few tests, it would be really useful. Um, and then we could start running them. Um, so that will be fun to play with this week, maybe. Does anyone have anything else they've thought of, noticed? Um, I guess I could show you the web page bit, just because it's quite pretty. Um, that one, I don't know who that was. No. There's a lot of these. Yeah, do it again. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -dum, uh, so yes, this is the output you get for that's unstable. Um, lots of packages. Um, what architecture it built for, and when, uh, and what went wrong. So as you can see, we have a lot of build depth fails, especially here. And you can just click on the log to see what baffed. Uh, if your window was the right size, you'd be able to actually see it. Let's try that. Here we are. Um, so generally, right down the bottom, it says, depends on bin utils, but it's not going to be installed. Hmm. Sounds like something that ought to be working, doesn't it? I don't know what went wrong there. Um, so. This is now, it's now very easy to see whether your package cross builds or not. Go and check. If it doesn't, um, see if you can help. It, in the case where it's a build dependency problem, there's not much you as a package manager can do. But if it started the build and failed, um, then you can fix that. Um, and we love more people to be doing this, because whilst it trundles along, it's quite slow. Is there any way you can parse those logs and actually get a listing of the ones that are being blamed for being uninstallable? Yes, there's all sorts of things you could do with that log pile uh, and generate much more exciting web page. So I mean, my, my error messages on the end are a bit low tech at the moment. It's, so I've got, I've got some nice orc scripts which uh, suck out the, some things it recognizes. You know, Unable to determine build status probably failed. It usually means something like didn't actually download any sources. It hardly started. Um, but a lot of the time, you've got failed build depths on met fences. But it doesn't, it doesn't list here which packages it was. And a bit more greppage could work that out. So uh, it started off as, as some orc. And this page is actually now generated by a Perl script, which isn't quite as disgusting. And in fact, that the greppage should just go into the Perl script and be one thing. Um, so yeah, it, that's in the XBuilder package. If you wish to download it and make it less crap, that would be great, especially because you can write Perl. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, we could also, what would actually be nice was historical statistics. So then you can find out the state of the last time things were built. So at the moment, if there's a successful build, it goes into Rep Repro and it never tries again. So we don't get to find out if, in fact, we broke it later at the moment. Um, but that's like Debian, you know, as long as we built it once, uh, <laughs> That counts um, until there's a new version of the source. And then we check we can still build that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it would be nice if we had you know, today this many packages built, and yesterday this many, and last week, just so we could see whether we were going up, down. Blah, blah, blah. So yeah, there's a lot of statistics we could do. I, ideally, I was originally, I thought, if I used the build the infrastructure, then we could use the PG status stuff that we use for the existing build the thing, and that would be great. But that is dependent on um, the build D database format. It's quite closely tied to it. So unless you're actually using our crazy build D stuff, you can't use PG status, which is annoying. Um, so because I picked a much simpler build D, I had to write my own crappy interface. So yeah, plenty of room for improvement there. Well, I think you're probably all bored now. Um, so we should stop, unless anyone has anything 
else to ask about? Okay. We're done. Thank you very well, much. You have that still was... 10 minutes if you want. Sorry? 10 minutes you have. Yeah, yeah I know, but we're, we're finished. It's like, there's, no Go point. On. <laughs> there's no point sitting here unless anyone actually has pressing issues to deal with. We can all go and drink coffee.